kamera sama ini mati hmm. aja. Hmm. All right. Um, okay. So I, I see that you know a lot of here us are here already, and everyone is uh, kind of waiting. So uh, without further ado, I will kind of start today's session. Um, you know, so before I start, I just want to do a very general introduction of uh, who's, um, you know, who, who am I today? A lot of you are wondering who, who is sitting in front of this computer right now, talking to you about implementing Safe Water Project. Um, so I'm Chong Ti, and I'm the co-founder of Waterroom. Um, you know, today's session is really about, you know, uh, learning the steps to success from start too sustainable, you know. Um, right now, there's about 2.1 billion people who don't have access to clean drinking water globally. And this leaves millions of children and family at risk of life-threatening diseases, right? This is especially dangerous uh, in the midst of this global pandemic where clean water is integral for disease prevention. Um, a little bit about water room, right? Just a little bit about water room. Um, you know, we started out about seven years ago, um, you know, really with the specific intent of actually tackling, um, you know, water issues in, in the area, right, in, in the area of Southeast Asia. Uh, over the past seven years, we have implemented more than 170 projects across 38 countries. Uh, we have seen a lot of different gaps, uh, a lot of challenges on the ground. Um, so what we want to do today is to bring our knowledge and resources to you so that you can plan, manage, and implement your own projects. And our company's vision is to build a world without prolonged thirst, um, but we are fully aware that we can't do this alone, which is why we want to educate, we want to spread awareness of clean water, you know, and, and our mission at Water Room is to provide honest solutions, honest water solutions for a better world. So, um, you know, I hope that today, you will be able to walk away with something useful, just a little bit of an overview of today's session. So today we will, um, you know, we'll learn how to assess the water needs of a community. We want to identify the water sources and suitable intervention areas. Next, you know, to, in order to do that, we need to know what is in the water. So what are the contaminants in the water and what's the best water treatment method you can use to tackle the problems. And with any project or, and with any initiative, right, there will be costs involved. So we'll be sharing a little bit about, you know, how you could manage budgets. And internally, we have, you know, prescribed kind of like um, frameworks you could use. So at the end of this session, we'll be sending out to you as well. Um, you know, also, and most importantly, uh, at, the, at the very end of the session, we'll talk about the monitoring and assessment frameworks uh, to measure the effectiveness of your intervention. So that would be very, very important as well. At the end of the webinar, We'll be sharing with you some of these precious, uh, precious uh, water resources. Uh, you know, um, so things like the toolkits for monitoring, uh, some of these frameworks, uh, budgeting sheets. So these will be things that will be very, very useful for you. Okay, so um, just a little bit of our deployment history that I mentioned just now. So we are one of the largest advocates for SDG 6. So you know, this is in support of clean water and sanitation. But you know, as we all know, water kind of it kind of permeates through um, various sustainable goals. So water is also integral for the good health and well-being of the individuals. You know, um, good water doesn't just improve the living conditions; it also improves the livelihood of people all around the world. And also, um, with the issue of things like microplastics and global warming, uh, you know, we are also a big advocate for a responsible consumption and production. So we want to make sure that you know we can do so. Um, through water as well. You know, this is an overview, just some awards and accreditation we have gotten over the years. So we are very thankful for some of them, uh, including ASEM Business Award and also being recognized as a UN SDG Young Leader Representative. So today's speakers, right? So a bit of my background, right? Because I, I think it's always good to start with a little bit of my background story. Uh, I got into, um, you know, the field of WASH because of my passion um, to make a difference in people's life. So um, I'm, I have a bachelor's in environmental engineering, uh, but I think what I can, what I think is most valuable today is uh, some of the experiences I had, um, you know, in these different areas, including, um, you know, the floods in Jakarta that happened, um, you know, a, a few years ago, 
you know, being involved in some of these rural projects in Bata Gabang, uh, Banta Gabang uh, and, and things like that. Um, sitting with us today in the audience is also um, Park Ideal. So Ideal is actually our Indonesian distributor. So she, he is our partner on the ground. So Park Ideal is actually an um, expert in emergency and disaster preparedness. And he has more than 16 years of experience in public health and vector control. So you talk about diseases and, you know, how to control them. Um, you know, he is actually a, a huge advocate in that area. And he has a lot of experience in that. He's also a distributor of multiple water products, right? Uh, including water rooms, uh, uh, room filler plus solutions. Um, you know, in our call today, there's also um, Vincent. So uh, Vincent is actually uh, one, uh, our CTO, our Chief Technological Officer. He's also our co-founder and uh, he's the one that's appointed by UN uh, for SDG 6. He's also a One Young World Ambassador, right? So he has kind of have a wealth of experience worldwide. And uh, he'll be joining us in the Q&A section uh, when if you have any questions about um, you know, water-related issues or if you have anything you know, you're not sure, you can also um, you share with us in Bahasa because um, you know, Vincent, he, he's an Indonesian himself, right? Okay, so before we start, I think it's good to do a very simple poll. You know, so um, we have Grace. Grace is actually our technical coordinator today. So um, Grace, if it's possible, can you um, launch the first poll so that um, everybody can, you know, um, participate in this, right? So uh, I'll give you all maybe about um, one minute for these three questions. So, you know, it's, 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 it's not, you don't have to be accurate. It can just be what you think uh, works best for you. Um, but the first question would be, what has been your greatest challenge, you know, uh, you face while implementing a safe water project, right? So if you can go to the poll and quickly answer these questions, it would be really helpful for us to know, um, you know, uh, what, what you experienced before. And, and during our, our, our seminar, I can share with you what to focus on. So the other question would be, you know, when are you intending to implement the next water project? You know, this is the first quarter of 2021. Right, so I believe there's a lot of things that uh, you know is kind of waiting you, and um, what are you most interested in today? I think I think many people are interested about water, but sometimes you know people are also interested in how you can implement them, how you can monitor and evaluate the issues. So, yep, I will give you guys another thirty seconds, and uh, once that's done, I will kind of round up this poll. All right, all right. I've seen that um, quite a couple of you, more than half of you have already answered the poll. So um, well, I see that some people have not, um, I think the majority of the people has done a project before, but one of the biggest issue is actually running a sustainable project. That is very understandable because these are common issues that we have heard on the ground. Some have never done a project before. Don't be worried. This is, um, you know, this is meant for you to be exposed to some of these elements that you need to look out for when you're dealing with, um, you know, uh, water intervention programs. You know, when it comes to implementing a project, I think um, I see some of you guys are actually interested in implementing in the next three to six months. You know, some of you are not too sure yet. That's fine as well, right? Maybe after this session, you have more clarity um, you know, and that may give you more confidence in doing something in your local community. And what are you most interested today? I see that most of you say that you're interested in everything. So that includes water assessments, implementation project, and how to actually effectively manage and monitor some of this, um, you know, uh, projects that you have existingly. So don't worry, we'll cover everything, um, you know, but uh, I also emphasize on some areas that you guys um, have you know, have more interest in according to this poll. Okay, so with this, I think I would end the poll first and I will jump right into, um, into, the, um, uh, into the presentation, right? So as I mentioned, there, there will be about six parts to this. So I'll pace myself, you know, and in between there will be polls so that you can also be uh, actively participating in them, right? Okay, for anyone who have joined, um, can you kindly just please mute um, so that you know, uh, you know, it doesn't affect the, the presentation? Right? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, to start off, right, I think what 
often of times before we start anything, the most important thing is to be able to gather information, right? And this is about collecting data, data in water, data um, of the population that you're hoping to help. Can you guys see me over here? Can you hear me? Okay, so these are a lot of the common questions that you need to know before you actually start a uh, water project. So the first thing is about understanding the water source, you know, what it is used for, how it is assessed. So knowing some of these issues will allow you to understand what are the co corresponding solutions that needed, you know, to fix the problem. So um, one of the other things that uh, we want to know is whether there's any chronic or recurring health issues among the population, because uh, when it comes to water, it actually goes, you know, water is really part of our DNA, right? Uh, we are made of 70% water and the earth itself is, you know, um, it is, there's water everywhere. So how is this actually impacting uh, the lives of these people? And health issues would be something that uh, we will be talking about a lot today. Next, we want to know who, who are we exactly targeting? So um, when it comes to um, population who are affected by water, a lot of time we will need to know how many people are there? And the demographic of these people, are there a lot of children and elderly in the group? Because these are the most vulnerable population. Are these people settled, migratory, you know, nomadic or displaced? So if you look at the news nowadays, um, you know, there are a lot of um, natural disasters and this can cause populations to be actually displaced and they, they might have lost their homes. So they might not have some of the common infrastructure that you usually see uh, you know, in a normal village or town. So um, when it comes to the population as well, it's good to know whether there are any communal areas. So things like the hospitals, healthcare, healthcare centers and schools uh, or religious buildings where people gather. These are very important places, right? Where people actually um, gain solace and you know, they, they kind of um, um, gather around this area for, for basic necessities. Um, and water is one of them. So, Lastly, when it comes to the population, we really need to look at the members of the communities that are involved. So um, how many people are actually involved in um, these water intervention programs, right? Because uh, you know, most of us, we are living in the cities and towns and we don't really live with the population. So having access to them would also mean them being part of our family, being them part of our team. So it is very important to make sure that things like um, you know, the people who are involved how are they included and where, uh, you know, where they are are actually very essential for an effective um, you know, uh, project being implemented. This is an example um, of one of our resources when it comes to um, community profiling and mapping. So you can see that this, in this very simple schematic, you can see where the water source is, is and also some of the uh, infrastructure that is available in this area. So in our... Um, water framework, you also see some of this data which will be very um, useful um, for your uh, operations in the future. So, you know, now that I've shared a little bit about uh, the general water profiling and community profiling information, um, how much of this information do you normally collect before deciding a treatment plan? Um, so, if you can just quickly answer the poll over here, it will be very helpful for us to just get a gauge um, whether these are information that you already collect or not. So um, Grace has set up the, um, the poll, you know, so if, uh, if you can, can you just quickly take a minute or 30 seconds or a minute to just do up the questions? All right, I see that a lot of you who actually join um, collects the water data, right? A lot of you also collect data of the population. Mm. And most of you, in fact, okay, I'm starting to get um, a sense of it. I see that a lot of you actually collect information about the community as well as the water, you know, prior to actually implementing a project. So, um, yeah, okay. So, okay, that's great. I see that actually about, I think, a good seven, 60 to 70% actually have, you know, have knowledge that they have to collect both information prior to, um, to doing something. And that's a very important first step you need to have before doing anything. Okay, with this, I'll just quickly end the poll over here. 
Right, so now that we know some of this key information about water assessment, about, you know, um, about, about the population, the next step is actually to know what is in the water. So to, you go, need to go to the root of the problem and address um, you know, the, the, the issue itself, the water. Okay, so some background information about um, um, you know, the sphere's uh, water standard. So when it comes to wa the water requirement of a person a day, we typically require at least 15 liters of water for emergency use. So um, of that, you know, we drink about 2.5 to 3 liters of water. That's kind of the, the basic amount you need for survival. Um, of course, this amount vary depending on the climate of, the, of the, uh, where these people are in, as well as individual psychology, right? Some people just drink a little bit more water because they feel a bit better when, when they have a bit more. Um, you need about 6 liters, 2 to 6 liters of water for basic hygiene, you know, and depending on social and cultural norms, you know, because water is something very sacred to many different uh, ethnic groups. So in certain cultures, you will require a little bit more water as well, sometimes uh, for hand washing, sometimes for the cleansing of the feet, you know, things like that needs to be, be accounted for uh, prior to actually deciding how much water is needed. And lastly, you know, besides drinking, you need to cook as well. And water is, of all the ingredients, water is the most common ingredient, uh, both for sanitary purposes and also for cooking itself. So, um, you know, we typically need about three to six liters of water every day. Next is about finding the right source, you know. So, one of the best way, right, one of the most practical way of choosing a water source is knowing where they are already collecting the water from because that water source is most likely the cleanest one that they have in getting the water and fulfilling the community's needs. You know, this basically in any, um, in, in, in any tribe or any village or any, um, community, you know, people will be gravitated towards sources that are clean. But of course, sometimes because of um, climate change, deforestation, the water quality might actually, you know, deplete over time. So it is very important for us to actually check the quality and quantity of the water, make sure that it's sufficient for the community's needs, as well if there's any obvious sources of contamination. So when it comes to water sources, there's about four broad categories. There's surface water, that's your rivers and lakes. There's rainwater. Rainwater will be basically anywhere, um, you know, um, that, that, that basically has, has rain or precipitation. Um, so in some places where it's a bit colder, ice can be considered as, uh, you know, precipitation is, 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 the ice itself can be a water source, right? Um, then there'll be things like, um, um, groundwater, so that's your wells, that's your boreholes. So for example, in Indonesia, it is very common for people to draw water from the water table. So that's groundwater, right? And then there will be seawater sources, uh, which is basically um, the most part of, of, of water on earth, right? Um, for ground, our precious groundwater source, that only makes up about 3% of the global water um, uh, we have. So most of them are actually made up of well water, uh, sorry, of seawater. But seawater is often saline and brackish, and they require a very complex uh, method to treat. Now that we know where are the key water sources, the next step is to understand some of the key uh, water quality indicators that is out there. So when it comes to water, there are four broad areas um, that is need. Uh, there are four things that you usually need. Okay, first it needs to be free from radiation. You know, it needs to be free of pathogens. It, need to, it needs to be aesthetically acceptable because if you're just to you know, follow WHO standards, sometimes uh, it can be a little bit broad. Uh, but you know, having water that is aesthetically pleasing, right, uh, and water that tastes good or smells good is also very important. Uh, lastly, it needs to be chemically safe. It doesn't have, uh, contain any chemicals that could be harmful for the body. For the types of water contaminants, there's three types. The first one will be biological contaminants chemical contaminants, as well as physical contaminants. The biological contaminants is actually one of our top priority when it comes to um, you know, the, the treatment of water. Because biological contaminants can cause acute problems, means that it can cause a very uh, a fast reacting um, um, effect on people, we need to actually curb them first. So biological contaminants includes a few categories, a few groups. Uh, the first will be bacterial. So bacteria include things like uh, E. coli or fecal bacteria. 
that is very common for causing things like um, uh, diarrhea and dysentery and vomiting. Um, and then there's also waterborne illnesses uh, like salmonella, typhoid fever, and cholera. Right? Cholera is very common among, amongst wells and they are all mostly waterborne. There's also protozoas. Protozoas are you know, um, uh, monocellular organisms in the water and it also comes with very high level of fecal pollution. So basically what comes out of the human, you know, it, tends to make, um, uh, it tends to make people fall sick. And these uh, issues like protozoa can be very difficult to treat because it also has high resistance to traditional treatments like chlorination. So uh, sometimes you will need something better to treat them. And lastly, viruses. I think that's uh, something that we all hear a lot about recently. You know, um, and viruses like rotaviruses, which are uh, bacterial phage or bacterial virus, viruses, they actually can infect hosts, actually can cause um, diseases such as um, a jaundice, you know, um, fever, vomiting, and sometimes death. When it comes to chemicals, often of times we, there, there's, uh, there's something called water hardness we hear about. So water hardness is, is something that is very common in uh, well water. Um, actually, uh, for, for, uh, for hard water, it is not typically a very huge hazard when it's consumed, but uh, it sometimes can cause some aesthetic issues, which is why some people would look for water softeners to treat their water. Right? But what is usually the most, um, um, most concerning amongst these three would be things like heavy metals. Right? So heavy metals and, and organics are basically things in the water that can cause uh, long-term health effects. So the thing about chemicals is that it doesn't cause an immediate effect. It's not acute, but cumulatively, they can cause um, a kind of a huge strain on the body over time. So uh, we need to make sure that the water is free of these water contaminants as well. Lastly, we have physical contaminants. So physical contaminants are things that makes the water contaminated. So um, one of the most clear visual cue that we get is actually turbidity. So turbidity is a determination of the water clarity. So when the water is very cloudy and murky, um, you know, when it has a lot of dust and dirt and, and suspended particles, it actually makes the water very um, um, uh, unpalatable. And um, these so uh, suspended solids and dissolved materials can also trap bacteria. You know, so they, they kind of create a very nice snuggly home for the bacteria to stay in. So in cases, in some cases where you boil the water, Right. Uh, even though it kills some of the bacteria in the water, uh, you might still fall sick if you drink water that is cloudy and turbid. So that is one of the, the biggest issue when it comes to uh, surface water sources that's out there. Um, just to touch vaguely as well, um, turbidity, you know, as is very linked to biological contamination, um, it can often cause a, a, a very common issue in, 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 uh, in rural areas and disaster zones because uh, there's no very simple method to do it other than maybe say filtration, right? So uh, this is something that uh, we need to take note of, you know, the first thing, whether the water is actually cloudy, whether it's turbid, whether it's dirty, and, and this will actually help us to, to, to guide us in, in, in finding the right solutions to tackle the problem. Next, I'll move on to water testing. So to know what's in the water, you need to test it, right? So, um, you know, water testing is actually something that a lot of people overlook, right? Because um, you know, uh, most of the time we might take some assumptions, but uh, according to the WHO, the consumption of contaminated water has caused about you know close to a million cases of diarrhea death every year. So no matter where you are, you need to know what's in it before you can treat it. For testing methods, there's many different ways that you can test water. So there's lab testing, diagnostic instruments you could use and portable test kits that you can do, you can use. Um, so lab testing refers to the use of, you know, a laboratory to, to actually um, uh, uh, to test, you know, you use very specific instruments to test for what's in the water. Um, in the case of water intervention programs, sometimes it can be a little bit hard to do laboratory testing because uh, for laboratory testing, you need to make sure that, um, you know, you are able to store the water in a very clean, and you know, it needs to be a sterilized bottle and also it needs to be kept at a cool temperature, which means that you might need to carry an ice box when transporting the water and you need to make sure that everything is done within uh, a good six hours so that the quality of the water doesn't degrade um, you know, throughout the transportation process. For lab testing, it can be a little bit costly as well, right? But of course, because you know, it comes uh, specificity. So you get very, very clear data 
uh, of what is in the water. So if you want to find out how much calcium is in the water, you can get the exact um, PPM or mg per liter in the water. Diagnostic instruments refers to some of these tools. Like, so if you have a pH meter, you have a thermometer. Uh, if you have, um, uh, say, a TDS meter, these are very specific tools that give you specific information about what's in the water. So um, this is usually, uh, most of them are usually portable, which makes it very easy for you to bring into some of these remote areas. Um, but um, the, um, the downside of it is that it, it, it tends to be very specific. So you might need to carry tons of tools, you know, when it comes to water testing in these areas. Lastly, we have portable water test kits. So um, portable water test kits refers to tools that we can bring around and they're usually disposable tests, one-time tests that gives you an indication of what's in the water. So um, just like the diagnostic instrument, it is very portable, it is highly mobile, so we can bring them into remote areas. But of course, um, um, you know, in terms of the, the specificity of portable test kits, they tend to be a bit general. They usually give you a range of what's in the water versus specifically how much is in it. So depending on your purpose, you will want to use this solution accordingly. Um, for water room as well, we do have portable test kits. So if you have any interest, you can also contact Parkadu or contact us if you need any, any of these things. So um, I will just quickly skip through some of these because I have touched on them earlier, right? But I will want to give you an example of laboratory testing. So this is an example of a laboratory testing that we have done before. So for example, you will look for, you know, what's in the water. So whether there's a presence of E. coli, which is fecal bacteria, uh, is an indicator for fecal bacteria. And you usually get like a set of results of how much in the water. So basically this has to be uh, negligible after testing. Uh, and then you get the different kind of uh, parameters as well. So the good thing about testing is that they usually need a very specific uh, indicator. Uh, sorry, it gives you a very specific result. And, and that helps you in, in, in actually making a, a, um, a, a guided decision, an informed decision on what to use to remove these things. Um, of course, the, the only thing about laboratory testing is usually accessibility as well as cost. So you just have to make sure that you manage that well. You can go for laboratory testing. Then for diagnostic instruments, right? Um, there's basically a range of it as well. So I'll, I won't touch on this too much, but there's basically um, you know, things like some of this uh, pH meter, TDS meter, which can give you a very specific data of what you need. And lastly, portable test kits. So as I mentioned, um, they're usually good for transportation, uh, but they're generally a bit more vague, a bit more broad in kind of the, the results they show you. So this is an example of um, you know, what you can get from a test kit. So uh, you, you basically you know, can find out about 10 to 13 parameters. So what you'll be looking for is usually the most apparent or the most um, commonly uh, found contaminants in nature. So that will usually be a way for you to know, um, to give you an indication of whether the water quality is good for drinking or not. Over here, I just want to share with you a little bit of um, the technical assessment guide that we have. So in one of the forms, uh, we actually have water technical assessment guide. So, you know, um, this basically helps you to um, uh, see what's in the water. So uh, if, you need to, um, if you need to actually find um, the amount of sulfate or total dissolved solids in the water, you can always use um, the water technical assessment we provide to give you a better idea of what's, um, of what's in your water. So now, uh, now that I've shared about testing, um, you know, I want to launch another poll to just get a sense of how much you have learned and uh, how much you know about this topic. So um, for the first one would be, um, which contaminants do you usually deal with uh, most often? Right. So if you can help us to, you know, just quickly answer the questions in the poll, it will help us a lot in, in, help, um, in giving us an idea on, on the issues that you are you're dealing with right now. Uh, and the second question for this poll is, uh, which one of these water testing methods are most familiar to you? So um, the three methods are lab testing, diagnostic testing, and portable water test kits. So, you know, this is a multiple choice question. So we can select A, B, or C, or one, two, and three. You know, uh, because we, we don't want to limit you to only selecting one of them. So uh, if you actually know all of them, you can select all of them. If you know two of them, you can go ahead with that. Uh, if you only know one of them, you can just, uh, just choose any one of them. That's fine as well. So we'll give everyone maybe about 30 more seconds, you know, just to let you think a bit. Okay, I see that the results are in. 
you know, so most people are aware of biological contaminants and that is also one of the issues that most people deal with. So I think understandably, bacterial and viruses are, are things that we deal with every day. Um, and these are usually when you talk about, um, in one of our latest report in Vanuatu, uh, in fact, one of the things that we are monitoring is actually whether people, people's health actually improve amongst like the toddlers, the infants, you know, uh, because we, we went, uh, you know, when we were collecting the data, we realized that a lot of people are falling sick because of, um, you know, um, possibly bacteria in the water. Yep. And then when it comes to testing methods, I think most people are familiar with lab testings. Um, you know, uh, understandably so. Um, but I see that quite a couple of people are also, you know, familiar with uh, portable test kits. And I believe that uh, that's also because uh, many of you are people on the ground, you know, you have uh, experiences, uh, you know, uh, going on to the, on these places before. And which is why, you know, some of you are also um, familiar with uh, portable test kits as a way to go. Okay, so now that we are done with um, testing, the next step is to you know, find out what are the treatment methods you have and how you can effectively distribute the water. Okay, I just want to quickly check in before I continue on this session, uh, if anybody has any burning questions, you know, if there's anywhere you're unclear. Okay, so if everything is, um, it's good so far, I'll continue. Uh, but if in any case, you have any question, you can just put your questions in the chat. You know, I would not be able to immediately address them, but we have a team uh, behind um, you know, this panel to be able to collect the information and we can address them at the end of this session. So next up, you know, how to treat the water? So I think that's the, the question that everyone is asking. You know, what, what kind of solution do I need to, to fix the water? You know, what kind of um, technology should I use? And to do this, we need to look, understand the water purification spectrum. So what you see over here is a chart showing the different kinds of contaminants in the water. So if you look over here, right, um, these are the different things that you see. So things like I talk about like bacterial, things like viruses, things like um, sand, you know, um, uh, human hair, pollen, mist, uh, yeast cells. You know, these are basically small particles, micro particles that you would see. And... This chart, uh, you can see from, from the left to the right is the size of it, so increasing size. So uh, when we talk about the physical sediments, they usually are in the 10 microns to 1,000 micron range. So this includes some of um, you know, the parasites in the water, like some of the water mites, you know, um, some of these uh, amoeba, single monos, uh, monocellular organisms. And when you move down the spectrum, you get into um, I mean, the, the micro range. So for, for anything that is between uh, 0.1 to maybe 10 micrometers, this will be your microorganism, this will be your bacterial, and sometimes you have things like asbestos, some of these organic pollutants in the water, latex and emulsions, colloids. These are very common things that you usually find in water uh, that is usually um, found you know, in, in, in rivers and lakes and wells. As you move down the spectrum, it gets smaller and smaller, and for viruses, they are in the nano range, for example. So for example, rotaviruses, right? Um, they are about, um, you know, 50 nanometers in size. And this requires, uh, you know, a different kind of technology for you to remove them. And lastly, we have some of um, the really tiny constituents in the water. There will be things like aqueous salts, herbicides, you know, uh, metal ions and so on. So things like that will require, um, a, 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 you know, a, a very energy intensive solution to fix that would be things like reverse osmosis, for example, to be able to, um, you know, for you to be able to remove them. When it comes to the treatment process, we have three main stages. So the first stage would be pretreatment. So pretreatment, um, you know, the purpose of pretreatment is to remove suspended solids and physical debris from the water. So this would mean, um, you know, some of the sand, the grit, the rocks. Uh, you know, what we want to do is to remove all of them first before it goes into the main treatment, um, the main treatment train. Why we need to do this is also because um, this will essentially prolong the lifespan of the system downstream, right? The, the, the more complex solution that you use later on, which are usually a bit more expensive. The next step will be for treatment. So this will be the removal of all the harmful uh, pathogens that we talked about earlier. And this includes a wide range of um, intervention methods, including microfiltration, including um, um, ultrafiltration, 
um, and including uh, you know, even things like uh, activated carbon removal, for, uh, sorry, uh, organic removal using activated carbon. Lastly, would be post-treatment. So post-treatment is the last step you usually have, you know, is the additional layer of disinfection to make sure that your water is safe for drinking. So that includes things like remineralization, uh, and it often includes uh, uh, the process of storage and distribution as well. Um, and as you can see over here, there's no um, one technology that fits, there's no one size that fits all when it comes to water treatment. And the te technology we select is always based on the composition of the water that, uh, that is available for the local community. For the first step, pre-treatment, there's a few ways that we could do it. You know, so um, from left to right, you know, we have kind of uh, different sizes of particles. So we have the large debris in the water, right? And then the final um, particles like suspended solids and colloids. So the size of the particles are also usually associated with increasing level of turbidity because the smaller and finer particles, they are more buoyant. And uh, you know, because of, of their density, they often kind of suspend in the water and it can be very, very tricky to remove. So for the large debris, you know, we can do them using methods like straining. So straining is basically pouring water through uh, a, a fabric material like your cloth, a shirt, you know, and it could be a metallic strainer as well. You know, and these are steps that usually you do to make sure that the water you're filtering doesn't have some of these big things that could cut the membrane or damage it. And then you have uh, steps like sedimentation. You know, um, so for example, the three pot method is a process of transferring water from one pot to the other and having a 15 to 30 minutes interval in between the, trans, um, um, the, the, the pouring of the water. So this method actually makes sure that the, the, the water quality becomes better and better as you, trans, as, you, as you transfer them along the way. And then there's microfiltration. So microfiltration um, uh, is, is basically the use of things like sand filter, uh, ceramic filters to be able to remove um, some of the finer particles. And there's things like coagulation and flocculation. So coagulation is a kind of um, a biochemical process, right? Of flocking some of, of, of kind of accumulating the, the, the fine particles in the water. And uh, coagulation is also very useful when it comes to very turbid water because it helps to remove some of um, the, the more tricky contaminants prior to going to the treatment phase. So largely for pre-treatment, they are good for removing the large particles, but they tend to not fare as well for removing maybe the, the smaller particles like bacterial and so on. So for example, even for coagulation, even though it kind of settles the large particles, um, it usually achieves an efficiency of about 95 to 99% removal. And while it sounds pretty good to us, right? 95 to 99%, uh, when it comes to our tap water, often we want to have even more assurance, right? Which is why um, we often make sure that the pre-treatment methods are accompanied with a primary treatment method. Right, um, can you just give me a second? Right, so next, um, you know, I want to talk about uh, secondary and post-treatment. Um, but as you can see over here, there's too many of them. So I, I, I prefer to do them through a summary. So these are the different parameters I talked about just now. So there's physical kind of um, parameters, the biological um, parameters, as well as the chemical ones. Right. So every, like I mentioned, um, you know, every technology fixes um, a specific part of the water. You know, so uh, it's really about mixing and matching the right things to be able to solve your problem. So for example, um, turbidity is largely removed through microfiltration. So that is actually a very good way of doing so. And you can also do them through straining and settling. Um, for bacterial, uh, the main way of doing them is I is in the secondary stage and the tertiary stage, which is mainly using ultrafiltration methods, uh, chlorination or UV. Um, then there's things like water hardness that will require a water softener. You know, if there's excessive chlorine in the water, you will use something like um, uh, Na2S, which is sodium metabisulfate or ac uh, activated carbon, AC cartridges. Uh, if there's a lot of nitrates in the water, then you would re rely on ion exchangers uh, or some of what you call them deionizers. Uh, where you can also use methods like uh, reverse osmosis to actually remove the contaminants. And there's also like other methods like iron manganese and hydrogen sulfide that requires uh, processes like manganese, green sand with potassium manganate, um, and also tricky things like arsenic that could be removed through a range of technology. Um, I think it's the, the best way for me to actually explain this is actually through an example, right? So let's imagine that um, we have a water, uh, a water sample we need to test. 
right? And um, you know, through this, I hope that you can get a better sensing of what I mean by finding the right technology to the right solution. So um, for example, after conducting a test on my well water, I detected you know, very high levels of coliform nitrates and total organic carbon in the water, right? And then I also hear about residents you know, complaining about a faint grassy smell or like a soy kind of smell when drinking the well water, right? Um, so if, this is, if the water is quite clear, you know, and uh, the sand particles are often not disturbed, how do I then treat this water, right? So based on this, we can look at the data that's available at the evidences that is available and make you know, some of these predictions of what's in the water, right? So if, you know, if the turbidity of the water is, uh, is very high, you know, we will require things like straining and settling as well as microfiltration to solve it. So for the primary and, pre um, um, primary and pretreatment phase, we'll use uh, maybe a pre-filter to remove some of these things and maybe a microfilter to, to remove the, the bigger debris and sediments. And because they are not very um, fine, the particles are not very fine, we wouldn't need to use something like coagulation to, to actually filter the water, right? So we can stick to maybe a pre-filter for straining and settling purposes. Um, then there is, we sense that there's actually a high bacteria count in the water. You know, we detect E. coli in the water. So in this case, we can use ultra filtration and we can do chlorination as an added measure just for added assurances, right? But at the very, very minimum, we also require a UF ultra filtration solution to remove the contaminants in the water. Then there's also, we, we you know people complain about a faint grassy smell and then there's a very high level of total organic uh, um, compound detected in the water. So this can be done, uh, this can be addressed by using an activated carbon, you know, because activated carbon uh, very effect, is a very effective absorbent for, you know, like uh, removing uh, organics, organic particles in the water. So it becomes a very good way for you to remove um, this, this um, 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 biological organic contaminant in the water. And lastly, there's things like total dissolved solids, right? Like nitrates, you know, caused by nitrates. And this could be re um, effectively removed using ion exchange, um, ion exchanges or deionization machines, uh, you, know, um, you know, and, this, and these tools can be used to actually uh, reduce the amount of nitrates in the water to make sure that the water is a bit more uh, palatable and safe for drinking. So I hope that this example also show you that, you know, you don't need everything in this solution, right? But it's also about finding the right thing you need um, to actually treat the water. So in my example, for example, if I say that the water is very clear and there's no physical sediments that's often collected, then you could even, even do with, with microfiltration. Maybe you can just do a simple uh, straining and settling method using a simple cloth or metal strainer, and that will be more than sufficient for you to treat the water. I just wanted to show you, um, you know, one of the, 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 the water treatment system that we have designed for uh, Indonesia and Sri Lanka, a project in, in a hospital in, uh, in, in Sri Lanka. And you can see that, um, you know, uh, when it comes to the water treatment, usually they are collected in the water tank. You know, sometimes they require a pump to filter the water. But if, effectively, what you have here is actually a pretreatment. So you can see that uh, there's a PP. PP refers to polypropylene which is a very common type of um, pre-filter that you can see from the market. And then there's a uh, AC, right? Uh, activated carbon filter that can come in granular form or kind of a block carbon form. And these are usually tools that you can use to remove like, you know, the organics in the water. You know, uh, in this case, uh, we detect the high levels of nitrates in the water as well. So we use a DI. DI refers to a deionization filtration uh, solution to do ion exchange over there. And then lastly, you know, to make sure that the water is safe for drinking, you know, we put uh, ultra filtration machine over here. In this case, it's our room filter plus to, to have it treated, you know, so that it's safe for drinking. And if you need to do chlorination, you could actually do it post, right? Meaning you can do it after your ultra filtration step. Uh, but in this case, this setup was, uh, was uh, what is needed for the project in Sri Lanka. And uh, over here, we have uh, kind of um, uh, the solution that we hold. So the room filter plus is basically this very lightweight and portable water filter we use uh, for filtration and for emergency use in remote areas. Uh, and as you can see, uh, for ultra filtration device, it is very effective for removing things like the protozoa, bacteria and viruses. So our very lightweight machine can actually remove the, um, uh, the biological contaminants very effectively, as well as things like the suspended solids in the water. Um, but what it can't do, for example, would be the areas of dissolved chemicals. So if you say you have hardness in the water or you have uh, like, you know, organic um, materials in the water, that would 
that would be when you will require something like an activated carbon or um, you know, a pre-filter to remove some of these things. Uh, at this um, point, we actually have a very short uh, pre-recorded demo you know, uh, to show you how you know, uh, filtration works um, you know, uh, and, and basically to give you a physical idea on, on how we can actually effectively remove uh, physical and biological contaminants in the water. So if you can give me a second, I will quickly switch my screen over to the YouTube page. Okay. Okay, Grace, can you guys see the screen over here? No? Okay, just give me a second while um, I wanted to quickly show you this video that I have. Okay, please give me a second just for me to solve this technical glitch. Huh? Um, screen two. Okay, can you guys see the screen over here now? Okay, I'll just kind of play this uh, very quick pre-recorded segment to show you how the room filter, our uh, room filter plus works. And also uh, this is a, a demonstration on how ultra filtration can remove things like the sediments in the water. As you can see over here, uh, in the setup that I have, the water is very contaminated, right? So uh, you will need something that can remove these uh, particles in the water to make sure that it's safe for drinking. Okay, I'm just going to play the video and please let me know if you can't hear anything, you know. Okay, great. So um, this setup is to actually showcase to you how ultra filtration works and how you can actually, um, you know, create clean water in a setting where there's no available electricity and no available infrastructure. So over here, this uh, bucket over here is to simulate a uh, water source. As you can see, um, the bucket contains um, uh, water that doesn't look immediately drinkable. Uh, it contains a lot of dirt and um, you, know, you suspect that there will be a lot of um, bacteria and protozoa that is being trapped over there. Um, you can see that in our setup, we make sure that our hose is half inserted into the water. right? By inserting half in the water, we are not absorbing all the debris and dirt and contaminants that have settled at the bottom. This is how um, this is the purpose of um, settling, right? You want to remove some of the, the, the coarser and bigger particles that could kind of clog up your system. Okay, and then the hose goes right into the system, right? Where it passes through a membrane. So over here for the room filter plus, we actually have membranes embedded within the water pump. This is to ensure that you're able to filter out um, the, the, the dirt and not just pumping the water through a system. We have a mock-up system over here that is transparent. Uh, this is just for purely demonstration purposes, but you can see that there are actually fine membrane strands, right? straw like um, um, fibers that's actually in the system. These membranes are used to filter out um, the small, tiny particles in the water, and uh, we'll be able to um, showcase to you in a short while how this is done. At the bottom, we have also added a pre filter. There's a pre filter compartment over here that is a small micro filter that is able to. Uh, remove some of the bigger particles like leaves and sand and grit uh, and that makes sure that the, the, the main ultra filtration device in the system is actually free, uh, free from uh, some of these larger particles. Okay, at this point, I will quickly showcase to you how um, the filter works. So yeah, there's a piston over here, right? You can just gently pull this up. So I'm doing this in a kind of like on a table just so that you, can, you guys can see it. But in the actual situation, we'll be actually doing it on the ground right with the filter kind of like in between my legs. So once the piston is open, you can just turn on the tap over here. Okay, gently press on the filter. And kind of just let the filter do its um, processing and purification work. So as you can see, in just a couple of seconds, you'll be able to filter out the water, um, the dirty water and get clean water from this process. Just take a seat. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm talking so much. Yeah, so basically the ultra filtration device can be used in various settings. And this makes it, makes it a very adaptable system um, in, in kind of a, a, a lot of these water, uh, water, water implementation projects that we do. This system doesn't just work through a hand pump system. So we actually have a lock device that allows it to be um, fixed to a water infrastructure. So if there are like available uh, water pipes or water tanks available, you can actually hook it up into hook it up to a, to, a, to a water source, and then you can automatically and autonomously power the system, right? Our system are currently going at 10% off for all uh, exclusively to our webinar attendees. 
So and if you're interested in this, uh, please drop us a note or you can um, you know, contact us at the end of this webinar to talk more about, uh, for us to talk more about how you can implement a water project through the room for the plus. Um, okay, so that's just a pre-recorded pre segment that we did, um, you know, for this webinar. So just let me just jump right straight right back to the slides. Um, okay, can you guys see the screen I'm sharing right now? Okay, all good. Okay, great. So um, basically, what I wanted to do was to showcase to you how the Rome Filter Plus works. And uh, you know, if you are looking to actually deploy a project and require a system that is very flexible and adaptable, um, please feel free to contact us uh, or Park Ideal for that matter. Um, we'll be providing the information at the end of this session. Um, so you can, you can definitely ask us more about the technology that we hold and how we can achieve the job of uh, clean water through these technologies and systems. Okay, so now that we have covered um, uh, the different treatment methods we have, you know, the next thing that comes to mind is the location. So when it comes to um, the selection of water treatment solution, we need to look out for first the infrastructure. We need to make sure the infrastructure is sound for distribution. For distribution. So we look out for things like the tanks and pipes that's available, whether that is a standing tap, for example, near a well, uh, whether there is um, a, a water tank that is um, helping to distribute the water in a local area. And what we want to do is to take advantage of existing infrastructure that is available on the ground. So the next thing after identifying the location is distribution. So uh, it, it makes no sense, you know, if people treat the water, but they can't have easy access to it. So um, distribution depends on a lot on the terrain, the ground constraints, right? So if you have, um, uh, you have a well water, but they are more than five, they are a few kilometers away from the community. Um, that wouldn't be something that is, is good because uh, if I have to walk about a km back and forth every day, um, that would be very, very challenging for me to make sure that I have proper access to water. So um, one of the considerations when it comes to ex uh, distribution is actually accessibility. It needs to be accessible uh, for everybody. So for example, a water point should be able to fit a maximum of maybe about 200 to 250 people. And it should be you know, ideally less than 500 meters away from the community. Always should select you know, places where people can get the water easily. So like health clinics, hospitals, schools, religious buildings, you know, so that water can be um, easily collected, um, can be easily distributed in a fair and equitable manner. Storage you know, uh, is also very important. So you can treat the water, but if you take the treated water and you pour it into a contaminated tank, or if you do not store it properly, you know, it can be recontaminated. So make sure that, you know, you use um, proper storage methods. Uh, for example, you know, um, bottles uh, or containers with leads are usually ideal so that, um, you know, dirt don't drop into the tank and uh, you can also prevent, um, you know, um, recontamination from happening. These are some of the additional considerations that is good to know. I won't go too in depth into them, but uh, you know, these are things that are related to uh, wash diseases. So you know, when it comes to, to water issues, it can be water wash, water-based or vector-borne. Uh, what's most important is that you know, um, these are things that we need to keep in mind you know, so that we are not just looking at the water as a way to drink or as a way to treat, um, but also water, how the water affects the environment. That is also crucial when it comes to um, implementing a sustainable project, you want to make sure that these issues are also dealt with. So for example, um, you know, if there is a stagnant water source that is known for having a lot of mosquitoes, right? So um, one of the things is also to, to think about whether, um, you know, there, are there any viable methods that you could do, right? So Park Ideal is very experienced in this area and he could be able to advise you more uh, should you be interested in that. As of today, um, you know, there's more than 47% of schools that lack proper hand washing facilities. And hand washing facilities needs to be accompanied with basic things like uh, bar soap, you know, things like that, you know, prevents people from uh, uh, falling sick and you make sure that they are able to clean their hands and remove the bacteria and viruses of their hands effectively. And um, one other thing that we need to look up for is, um, you know, set proper sanitation as well as hygiene promotion. So hygiene promotion is a, a very systematic and intentional way that we, that we set up to, to educate people 
on how to actually mitigate um, uh, the preventable wash diseases. And, and, and it usually involves a combination of tools like you know, education and uh, you know, uh, enabling facilities, water stations, so that people can partake in this process and also make sure that um, the children are also aware of these things. So a lot of times we do hygiene promotion in schools because um, the, the children are a little bit more open and, and, and uh, uh, open to, to learning and you know, they're, they're easier to influence compared to maybe uh, the elderly who are a bit more set in their ways. But this is something that we need to, um, uh, to ensure when it comes to um, uh, having a very holistic program for water. Sanitation, I won't touch too much on it, right? But uh, basically, uh, it's more than just toilets, right? It's also about um, having the right environment. You know, so clean water is, is definitely a, a, a need, you know, if you want them to be able to uh, have a corresponding uh, change in their behavior when it comes to sanitation as well. Okay, so um, budget and constraints. Um, I'll touch on this lightly, but I'll just cover some of the broad points and main points when it comes to budget and calculation because I think this is quite straightforward. There is three categories that you need to take note of. The first one is your total fixed cost or your capital expense. So things that uh, relates to your infrastructure. So things like maybe, um, you know, the water tank that you need to have, the piping you need to build, for example. Um, and then also things like your operation costs. So this might be the day-to-day -day kind of costs, things like maintenance and caretaking, the manpower related costs. These are the second thing that you want to care about. Um, the, the, the third thing will be monitoring and, you know, evaluation processes. So, because the cost of these devices may not vary widely depending on how the water is distributed, um, the cost of supporting infrastructure is often a constant, you know. So, um, sorry, let me, let me repeat this again. Um, the cost of water purification devices and overall water treatment may not vary very widely, right, um, depending on how it's distributed, but the cost of supporting infrastructure and operating expenses might vary depending on local requirement, right. So, basically, water you know, the technology you use tend to be a bit more consistent, but the operating cost is usually the one that would differ, you know, based on what's on the ground. I will share more with you through an example. Um, so, for example, uh, if you are in a place where people are collecting the water themselves, what you need for a supporting infrastructure would just be maybe a, a basic fence or protective casing to make sure that the, the water station is safe and you know, no one do something funny like uh, maybe dismantling them or stealing them, right? But when it comes to you know, distributing through a uh, distributed uh, water facility, you will need maybe like you know, um, a heat gun and heat sealing bottles for you to actually uh, do the proper sealing and bottling of the, of the, uh, the water bottles, for example. Um, for the operating uh, expenses, they will be also a bit higher because you need to maybe take care of things like delivery if you are taking care of the delivery of the water, right? And also you need to make sure there's things like uh, maybe um, uh, household bleach or some of these added tools to make sure that the water are well treated before they are distributed. So based on what you are experiencing, your budget will vary. Um, and then there are also some of these considerations when it comes to um, the management uh, of, of your water. So I won't go too in depth in this because we'll be providing you with the financial calculation sheet. Um, but what you need to take note of is um, how water is managed, you know, how many people are affected, and also what is required for the community. These are usually your key consideration when it comes to planning. So now that you have the rough costing, right, you know what to buy, what you need, and you know how to distribute the water, the next step will be implementing the project. And when it comes to implementation, these are steps that are actually quite common so if you do project management, maybe as your job or you have done then in school before, it is quite similar. First, you always scope and design. Then you find what are the, the logistics and distribution methods, like the manpower procurement, and then you do installation and training. So for scoping, you know, scoping would be things like finding the right source, finding the right technology, right? And then designing them according to what you need, right? Then the next one would be uh, logistic and uh, um, manpower. So uh, choose the type of, choose the way that water is distributed or delivered. Uh, appoint the right people you need. So sometimes you need to find your local contractors, your plumbers, you make sure that you can find them. And also finding the right caretakers because not all places will have a caretaker. So it is good to keep this operation cost at the top of your mind. 
because in, in, you know, to make sure that your system is sustainable, you need to find the right people to take care of it. And for example, in a school, it could be a gardener, right? So a gardener takes care of most things, the handyman takes care of most things, but uh, this could be an added list of things that he will take note of so that you know, he could collect data along the way. And having these things will make sure that your projects are executed properly. Uh, lastly will be installation and training. So you want to set up the system, commission it with the local residents. You know, uh, one of the things that people don't, um, don't realize is very important is actually the community's involvement in the project. So if you were to install and do the training without anyone there, um, it's very hard to get the buy-in from the locals. You know, and this is also the perfect chance for you to showcase the technology. And um, the, the, you know, through, through the, the process of demonstration, you can, you can convince them uh, you know, through action uh, versus like, you know, giving just purely pamphlets and trying to persuade them. So these are things that uh, is very essential when it comes to a project implementation or a successful implementation. Our, at this point, I'd like to give two examples um, when it comes to project implementation. The first one would be a refugee camp and the second one would be a rural village. I just want to show you a slight difference in the way we, do, we, we, we deal with these projects. So for example, if we are doing it for refugee camp, which is usually related to you know, post disasters or some kind of human conflict. Um, a lot of time, the people here are a lot more nomadic. There's people constantly coming and leaving. You know, um, there is usually no electricity or very limited electricity available because of the sheer size, the population density. You know, and then um, the water sources that's available are usually uh, what's available near them. It might be a lake, uh, it might be a hand dug pothole, um, and the supply is usually quite contaminated, right? Um, in the case of a village, you know, or like a small town, um, most of the people there are usually a bit more settled, right? So you're talking about families, uh, usually the young and the elderly are usually there. Sometimes the adults go out of the cities to work, but they are more or less a more settled population. They're not transmigratory, for example. The basic, the water infrastructure is usually available. You know, you might see things like simple tanks or simple standing taps, or, you know, and there will be power. It might be a bit intermittent, right? Sometimes you get a few hours of electricity a day, but there is still power. There are still generators. Um, and the water supply that you get is usually um, consistent, but they're just not that clean, right? So in the first scenario for a refugee camp, um, you know, you need to make sure that when you're scoping, you're taking account into things like the, 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 the population characteristic. So if they're nomadic, you, know, you need to make sure that um, the technology that you're you are implementing cannot be too, too complicated because um, the people are coming and going, you know, uh, and, and, and new people might be using the system in this, uh, you know, throughout this, this entire uh, process you're implementing the, the, the program. So it needs to be simple um, and you need to expect a slightly higher frequency of replacement sometimes because of the nature of these people, right? So things like that will help you to kind of create a buffer when you're doing the costing. Then next, when it comes to the logistic and manpower, because if we are talking about a refugee camp, they may lack a local economy or local market. So the solutions that you procure um, might need to be from the nearest market. So for example, if you are um, in the village, uh, you might need to look for the nearest uh, town, you know, you could get the technology. Uh, and also identify the technicians if possible. Finding the right people to take care of the systems uh, is still very important. You know? And uh, when it comes to um, logistic and procurement, you may also will expect a little bit of higher cost of customs and duties. Uh, this is usually expected for very remote areas uh, that is under a lot of stress. Um, lastly, when it comes to installation and training, you know, it's, always a, it's always the same thing. Train the local community and focus on the people. When you focus on the people, um, they have the buy-in and then you, you, know, you are more likely to have a successful project or successful implementation. For a rural village, you, know, you can imagine that the situation is quite different. So I just lightly touched on some points, right? So in, this, in a place where it's a bit more settled, convenience is actually a, a lot more important. And also the leveraging of existing infrastructure is also necessary because if you want it to be cost-effective, you need to find the, the nearest place where they have this uh, water infrastructure available. So source, the, um, when it comes to sourcing, you know, try to source from locally or from the nearest market. And um, you know, choose economic shipping routes when possible because when you want to ship items, um, you know, it can be quite costly, especially if you are doing things like air freight or even sea freight. So choosing economic shipping options uh, is usually better because you can plan a bit ahead of time. You know, compared to an emergency situation where you know, people 
time is of essence and you need to get it very fast. Uh, in the case of a rural village, you can plan properly, you know, and then you can send out the items when the time is right or when the cost, uh, or maybe you can take a slightly longer delivery time to make sure that the, the costing is well managed. Um, lastly, when it comes to installation, um, I, I think there's not much difference here, but uh, local buy-in is, 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 uh, is very crucial. By the way, the two photos I'm showing here are actually photos that we, we took when we are, um, this is in the Rohingya camp in the Myanmar Bangladesh border. Um, this is actually a photo in uh, the Myanmar Thailand border where uh, you know, the villagers are, are actually getting water uh, in their small local town. So in their small local village. Okay, now I'll move on to one of uh, the last few points. How do we create a sustainable and uh, um, uh, project and how do we empower the community? And, um, you know, I will talk on five points. There are, there are many five points over here, but uh, I think this is, is to, to, to kind of sum, sum it up, it's actually very similar to how we establish rapport with people we are working with, right? The first step is always to make sure that we know who the key stakeholders are. So, uh, you know, it could be a doctor, it could be a local NGO, it could be a village head, it could be sometimes a religious leader. You know, these are people who are influential, you know, who are also have the command of the locals, right? So, it is, if they are convinced, if they, are, if they buy into to what you want to do, it will be a lot easier for you to implement your project. <clears throat> Next is actually a set up communication platform. If you want to, um, to, to, to establish, um, you know, uh, uh, to make sure that things are accountable, you want to get information, it's important to use localized community channel. So for example, um, uh, when we are in the Philippines, we use uh, Vibo. Uh, you know, in Indonesia, we use, I actually use WhatsApp, sometimes Messenger, um, you know, uh, and in some of these areas where you have WeChat or Line, you know, you just use the right system for the right place. And that's how you actually make sure that you constantly engage with them. Set up local workshops and demonstrations. You know, like I mentioned, uh, uh, knowledge is power. Uh, you know, if you can conduct some of these um, uh, demonstration uh, kind of like uh, settings, you will be able to educate them on how to use the system effectively. Um, the next step is also to establish social contracts. So this is about building relationships. Um, you know, to, to make sure that people are motivated to, to take care of them, you know, is to make sure that um, the leaders have a sense of ownership and then there's always like a constant update, you know, between these two parties. <clears throat> Lastly, we want to highlight the importance of exchanging information periodically. So uh, we will be providing you with some framework so that you can actually brief them on what to do so that they can collect this information prior to, um, um, you know, prior to, to leaving them or prior to, to you know, or, or after a commissioning of a, of a water system. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, Monetary evaluation, I will just touch briefly on them, but I think we all know how important it is to actually um, you know, have, have proper systems put in place to monitor and um, to, to actually um, uh, um, uh, collect data, right? As we are running some of these uh, water stations. So there's usually about a few key information to collect, you know, things like the location, uh, the demographic, who are the people using it, you know, um, the health issues, and also, like, how is it changing along the way? Number of cases of, of health issues improving along the way. And lastly, on filter maintenance, we need to make sure that, um, you know, the filter operators are there to make sure to, to, to take care of things, um, you know, along the way. This is just a form that we'll be sharing with you later on, but this allows you to actually track some of the data that will be essential for uh, monitoring and evaluation. Yep. Uh, some additional information, you know, this style of list will help you to be able to identify uh, if there's any issues that, that might arise, you know, uh, during the implementation of, of your project. And, you know, uh, with this data, it will help you to, um, it will help you to be able to, to address issues uh, uh, more timely um, and also make sure that you are able to, to help them um, in these areas when needed. The last part, which is part six, will be on post-implementation, right? So um, this is a bit tiny over here, but as you can see, um, you know, there is a lot of different things we want to measure. So um, when it comes to um, the, the satisfaction of the local, it's good to understand like whether they, they are very receptive of it, whether there's a positive kind of, um, uh, you know, whether you can sense that they are positive using the systems. Um, having all this information will also help you to, to tailor the, the right solution for your next operation. And, you know, when it comes to project, honestly, there is no one size fits all, which means that every 
um, you know, every new project that you do could be slightly better. And this continual process of self-improvement is, is very much needed, um, you know, uh, if you want to make sure that um, your programs get better and you're able to, um, to, to customize the right solutions to the right needs on the ground. So um, we will also be providing um, this information to you post-webinar. Uh, post so um, uh, you can definitely use these tools to, uh, to help you to, to tackle these issues on the ground and collect um, the necessary data required. So um, we have come to the end of this webinar, right? Uh, at least for the sharing session, right? Uh, we'll have a poll for you. And we want to know, um, you know, whether you got all the things that you want from today's webinar. Uh, you know, this is, uh, the, the session itself is about one hour plus long, so I know it's a little bit long. Um, but, you know, we, we really wanted to give you a very comprehensive um, um, set of information that could enable you to do something. You know, so if you can take a minute um, to do up the, um, the, the, the poll, it will really help us in, in uh, you know, in, in, in improving our, our sharing process and, and you know, process of, uh, of training and, and yeah. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm, I'm very heartened to see that uh, most of you uh, actually got what you wanted and also a bit more. Um, you know, I, I'm, our team will, uh, is, is very heartened to, 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 to learn about that. And most of, I think a huge bunch of us also got what you hope to get. And I, I think that is, uh, that's good to, for us to know as well. Um, there are some of you who actually got um, the relevant data. So I hope that uh, with the additional materials that I shared with you, it will help you with your future, um, you know, in your future operation. I understand that some of you here are very experienced in WASH programs, you know. So um, over here, what we are trying to do is really to help the value add to your processes. So, I mean, the tools that we're providing for you doesn't necessarily need to replace your existing set of information. But if what we provide for you today is helpful, you know, you could even take the, 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 the old information we are providing for you and, you know, maybe add it to your existing checklist or existing framework. Uh, you know, essentially what we are providing is open source information. We want everyone to benefit from this process uh, because it is in our vision to build a world without prolongers and uh, we want you to be part of this, this journey with us. Okay, so uh, I see that most of you have voted. Um, thank you so much for voting, right? Um, and thank you so much for your time today. Uh, so I've kind of reached the end of uh, the, the webinar. And, um, you know, we'll be opening up for Q&A. But before I go to that, um, you know, I just want to thank uh, uh, everybody who has been part of uh, this, you know, who has spent your time joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking your, your afternoon from work or from your, sometimes from your kids uh, just to sit in for this. Um, you know, I also want to thank our partner, uh, Park Adieu, right, uh, you know, for, you know, just liasing down things on the ground. If you have any questions uh, for Park Adieu, um, you know, or us, you can just drop it over here. We'll be, um, basically, we'll be, be answering all your questions and doubts. And if you need any extra, you have any further queries, you can book a consultation with us. Uh, the QR code, you can just scan the QR code, you know, drop us a contact, say that, and just let us know that you actually joined the webinar because uh, you help us to know that, you know, like you have gone through this, this process and this through this, this lecture, this lecture, um, you know, but if you have anything very specific to Indonesia that you need a system, uh, you, you need to purchase some, uh, some parts or some technology, uh, you can always contact uh, Park Ideal directly and you have his email over here. Um, or if you have anything that is a bit more general that you want to ask us, just feel free to drop us an email on support or just drop us a document over here. Right. Um, so now I would love to open up, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the ground, uh, open the questions to the floor, uh, and um, I would love to address them accordingly. So um, I got the, okay, maybe I can just answer a, a question first. Um, okay, so I think um, there's Elena from YMP in Lombok, Indonesia. <clears throat> uh, you're asking if you can get a, the presentation material because uh, you would like to do the trans you want to translate the look uh, the information and also um, provide them locally. Um, we will be sending you um, some of this deck and we will have an uploaded version uh, of this webinar uh, later on, right? So um, once we send this information, please feel free to translate them. 
um, you know, and, and use it to train your local people. I, I believe that it will go a long way for you. So, uh, you know, we welcome you to use the information we have over here. And you also shared, said that uh, we have a water room block uh, that, um, that you have actually read from. Um, the water room block information is, is basically public, you know, so you can use them. Uh, and of course, we will really appreciate if you can just uh, do the accreditation because our team of writers and content creators put in a lot of effort um, for the information on the blog. So if uh, you can just credit the source, um, you know, where you got the information from and just maybe drop us a notification, uh, we will really appreciate that. Lah. So um, uh, just let us know so that we can send you the copies, um, uh, you know, and we just make sure that it's fairly accredited. And uh, you would like to get the portable desk test kits. Um, you know, uh, you can just drop an email to us uh, on the number of test kits you want. Uh, and uh, Jeron will send you more information on that. Okay, another question about, um, are we getting the slides at the end of the session? Uh, of course you are. Uh, we're sending the information uh, to you. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> okay. So thanks Mary for dropping a note, uh, you know, for the comprehensive overview. I hope that it is useful for you. Um, let me just see. Okay, I think that's a question from Susanna. Uh, so Susanna's question is, do wastewater, um, could this be applied to wastewater treatment in hospitals? Okay, so uh, that's a great question because I address water treatment for drinking and general use, but I did not talk about wastewater treatment. <clears throat> so for wastewater treatment, they typically require a very different set of treatment method because the wastewater that you're treating doesn't need to be that clean for drinking. Unless you're saying that you need the wastewater for drinking, you, most of the time, uh, the wastewater doesn't need to be of that quality. Um, we do have um, solutions, right, for basically hospitals for water treatment. So if you are in a place where you are trying to raise funds for, you know, a water treatment device, uh, you could potentially use um, one of our technology for wastewater treatment, but that um, the room filter plus is more for drinking purposes. So I don't think it, it is um, such a, uh, it wouldn't be the right tool to use, right? If you want to use it for wastewater treatment. But of course, if you have more inquiries, you can let us know. Um, for wastewater treatment for hospital, you know, we might be processing very large and huge volume. So we might need uh, some form of containerized solution for that. So if you have uh, more questions on that, uh, you know, we have partners that can do that for you in Indonesia. So just write us, um, you know, tell us why it is and we can, we can have a further conversation on it. Okay, thank you Anjad for the kind words. Uh, appreciate the, the comment. Um, you know, big thanks to the team who actually created everything here. Um, hmm. Okay, so I think the is an issue about... Um, okay. So I think for some of y'all, you, uh, you guys also found existing solutions in the market. You know, over here, I mean, there is really, uh, I mean, when it comes to water technologies, there are options in the market, right? So um, of course, I mean, uh, we, over here, what we are, our purpose is, is actually to kind of educate you on what options are available and also to make the informed decision. Because we feel that a lot of times, um, especially in the market, um, we, we see that there are a lot of companies that are just really trying to, sell you the water filter. So they'll, of course, try to, they'll give you a lot of health benefits that you might get from the system and they might give you a lot of, I would say, interesting and colorful kind of like a descriptions of what the water filter can do. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I have no issues with anyone getting systems from, from those kind of sources and they are completely fine. But um, uh, I hope that this session can help you get a, gain a better clarity on what are the key essentials in the water. And you know, if it can help you make an informed decision in the future, or if this information can help your friend make an informed decision in the future, I think that that would have really served the purpose of this, um, this, uh, this lecture or this sharing session. So um, you know, I hope that uh, you guys can walk away with something that is useful. Hmm. Um, okay, so we also would love for you guys to do up a survey for us because you know um, our team has 